Here we are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event in partnership with ETS Global. My name is Stefania, and I will be moderating this webinar on behalf of Toxity. So I see here that our first participants have joined us, so a warm welcome to all of you. We are just going to wait a few minutes before we dive into our session to ensure that everyone has a chance to connect. So in the meantime, don't hesitate to say hi or introduce yourself in the chat here on Zoom. Furthermore, we are curious to know where are you joining us from. So please take a moment to share your location in the chat. Thank you for being here and we will start shortly. In the meantime, I wanted to inform you that we got also a Q&A session lined up right after the presentation. So this is your chance to ask all your questions to our panelists. So don't be shy, go ahead and type your questions and curiosities in the Q&A box. We will be thrilled to answer them. Also, if you're interested in receiving a certificate of attendance issued by Doxity, stay tuned because we will provide more information after the presentation, along with a special discount from ETS exclusively for today's webinar attendees. So um, let's go now to the lineup. In today's webinar, we will cover the basics of applying to higher education programs. You will learn how to craft compelling letters of recommendation and essays with our expert tips. We will also discuss the TOEFL, the most widely accepted English test, and hear from a testimonial whose career was launched also thanks to this test. So as you can see, I will not be alone. Here with me, there are Candy, university admission expert, and Candy has helped more than 700 students get accepted into the world's most elite universities. Marta, English language training coordinator for ETS Italy. Marcus, English language training coordinator for ETS Spain. And Georgia, student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So thank you for being part of this event and thanks to all of you. Without further ado, let's get started. So Candy, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much. I shall share my screen with you all. One moment, please. Okay. I believe you can see my screen, correct? Yes. Perfect, wonderful. Thank you so much, Doc City. Thank you to ETS, um, to TOEFL, IBT, et cetera. It's so exciting to be here. I'm really happy to talk to you guys about um, study abroad and how to ace your university application to study abroad because I'm absolutely passionate about it. It's something I really and truly care about. It's my work. It's what I do every day. So I'm hoping that I can share with you some tips that will, will help you do the same, will help you ace your application. First of all, you're probably wondering who I am and why I'm going to talk about this. Well, my name is Candy Lee LeBall, and since 2005, I've been working to take out the mystery and the misery of applying uh, to university programs ab abroad. I was recently voted the number one consultant in the world, which was kind of crazy and also very humbling. And I'm very uh, a good reflection of you know what my clients think about me. I am a board member and incoming president of AGAC. So AGAC is the only organization in the world dedicated to the ethics, professionalism, and transparency of admissions consulting. And best of all, I've helped 700 people uh, get into university programs around the world. And I'm hoping that today with some of my information that I share that I will help you become one of them too. So to get started, in order to ace your university application, you actually kind of first have, you have to know a bunch of stuff, okay? There's some, some basic things you have to know. Uh, first thing is that there are different types of university degrees. So in order to um, ace the application, you need to know what you're applying to because the application process will be a little bit different. The most, the, the basic one is called the undergrad degree or the bachelor's. So this is the degree that you would apply for when you're 17 or 18 years old and you're ready to go study economics or history or engineering. Uh, so the first time you go to university or college, you would be applying for an undergraduate degree. The next one, we have two different types of masters. So there's something called the pre-experience masters. And this is very important to know what that means, because what pre-experience means is that there's no work experience. You finish your undergraduate degree and you go directly into one of these master's programs. So master's in management or the MIM is a, is a very good example. Um, some of the master's in finance programs are pre-experience and pretty much any other master's program. So master's in engineering, master's in um, astrophysics, whatever it might be, you would uh, do those without work experience. So as you can imagine, a post-experience degree requires work. 
Uh, the most common post-experience degree is the Master's of Business Administration or the MBA. You have to have a minimum of two years of work experience to qualify, uh, to even be able to apply. Like before you can apply, you need that experience. Some Master's of Finance, other different, different degrees like an MPA also require experience. So it's very important that before you start your university path that you know what kind of degree that you are applying to. Okay. Now, in order to apply to these different degree programs, where you have to have certain things. The, I like to call these the basics, like the, the core of what's necessary. Uh, first thing would be an academic record. So an academic record is proof that you have an education, that you're smart. Um, if you're applying for an undergraduate degree, you need a high school diploma. Uh, maybe you have an IB. If you're in Spain, maybe you have a bachillerato. Um, this is the your high school degree that says, hey, I completed my 12 years of study. I'm ready to go. You know, let me into your program. If you're applying for a graduate degree, whether it's pre-experience or post-experience, you're going to have to have an undergraduate already. It goes undergraduate, then master's, one and then the other. Um, so you have your bachelor's degree already. Now, the academic record is very important because when you apply to a university abroad, they want to know if you have the academic ability to succeed in their program. So good grades are essential, right? So any of you who are still sitting in your university program thinking, oh, I'm gonna go abroad in a couple of years, please focus on your grades. You wanna get good grades because they really are gonna help you um, have more success. We think about grades in terms of what we call the GPA. So when you apply to different universities, if it's um, from Harvard to the University of Exeter to Birmingham to Cambridge, they're going to ask about a GPA. So the GPA is your grade point average. I'm from America, the US. We use a four point system, right? I'm not going to tell you what my grade point was, but it was out of a four. Here in Spain, where I live, we use a 10 point system. So I might have a, you know, an applicant who's going to the Polytechnica of Madrid, and they would have a 7.8 out of 10. In Italy, I understand that you use a 30 point system. It's very important when you present your academic record to a university abroad that you keep your grade in your local system. So if you went to a US university, you say, I've got a 3.6. If you went to a Spanish university, you report your 7.8. You don't convert it back into a different system. I think that's um, really important to know. I think it's an important tip to share with you. So that's your first basic, to have an academic degree with really good grades. Now, the second thing you're gonna need in order to ace your application is letters of recommendation. Pretty much every university out there from Brown to Stanford to ESA and Barcelona is going to require letters of recommendation as part of the application process. And they're important. They're, they're not simple like, dear school, we think you know, Maria is great, but they're much more detailed. If a Depending on the type of degree, degree you're going for, it will depend on the type of recommender you ask. So if you're applying for your very first undergraduate degree, uh, your bachelor's or pre-experienced master's like a MIM, most of the time you need a professor. You'll need between one to three professors who are going to write a letter of recommendation for you. You can also get, if, if you've done internship, if you've done you know, some sort of part-time work or volunteer work, you can probably use a supervisor from that as well. Now, a post-experience master's, as we know, requires work, so you have to have a work supervisor. For an MBA, you cannot choose a professor. It's not a, It's not that it's not allowed, it's just not going to help your application. You're not going to ace your application if you do that. So very important that you know who to choose. Now, when you choose them, let's say you ask your professor, you ask your boss to do it, they have to work. They have to do some work on your behalf. They have to either write a letter that letter might say, dear admissions, my name is Professor Joe. I work at the University of Birmingham and I want to uh, strongly recommend Marcus as a great applicant. That's one way. Most of the time it's gonna be a series of questions. So anywhere between four five or six questions asking things like, please describe the applicant's strengths. Can you describe the applicant's weaknesses, their ac academic ability, et cetera. So these letters, are pretty intense. They might be a thousand words or even more. It's a lot of work. So it's very important that the person you ask likes you and knows you. And so this is why this tip I'm gonna tell you right now is probably one of the most important tips I can give anyone who's at the very early stages 
of applying to a, a, a university abroad is that you need to build relationships. You know, if you are in university right now and you're thinking you're going to go to study abroad in a couple of years, you need to look around, find a professor and build a relationship. See if you can do some teaching assistant or maybe they can um, uh, help you with your thesis. But if you try to go to a professor that had 80 students in the class and you were just one of them, how are they going to write you a letter? They don't remember you. You need to build a relationship. Uh, same thing for, you know, the MBAs or the or the uh, the post experience. You want to make sure your boss likes you. So you have to ask for a supervisor. Make sure you have a good relationship with that supervisor because that good letter of recommendation is going to go really far into making sure that you can ace your application. So building relationships, super important. And then we have the test. So if you want to study abroad, pretty much every university out there is going to have some sort of standardized test that you have to take. Uh, in the U.S., we have, uh, for undergrad programs, we have a test called the SAT. There's another one called the ACT. Uh, if you want to apply it to the U.K., there's a different type of test. If you're looking for a graduate degree, whether it's a MIM or a master's in finance or an MBA, you're going to have to take GRE, a GMAT, an LSAT. There's so many different types of tests. So know what program you're applying to and make sure that you, you take the right test. However, all of them are gonna require an English language test such as the TOEFL IBT, which is uh, what we're gonna talk about a little bit more today. If you went, if you're from a country where English is not the first language, if you go to a university or high school where English is not the main language, you're gonna have to take the test. And it's a very, very important part of applying. It's one of the basics. So I'm gonna turn the screen over now to Marcus and Marta, who are gonna to talk to you about TOEFL IBT. Thank Marcus you, thank you so much, Candy. That's really, really useful information and really important. A lot of key, key issues there that, that, that students should be aware of. Um, so yes, we are gonna talk about the TOEFL test today. Um, as we said at the beginning, my name is Marcus. I'm the ELT coordinator for Spain and Portugal. And Marta, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, hi everybody. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you again, Candy. Uh, my name is Marta. I'm ELT coordinator for Italy, and I'm based in now rainy Milan. <laughs> and I'm based in luckily sunny Madrid. <laughs> Always Originally from New York, but but based in Madrid. So welcome again, everyone. Bienvenidos a todos. Bienvenidos. Benvenuti a tutti. And let's jump right in to the TOEFL, which is a test. And what better way to start talking about a test than giving you a little test right here, a little pop quiz for you. Just a quick question. Do you know how many institutions accept the TOEFL IBT test worldwide? Don't worry, I'll give you four choices here. We have A, 2,500, B, 5,200, C, 12,500, or D, 125,000. What do you think? You can just take a quick guess, type it in the chat, A, B, C, or D. See? Okay, I see, okay, I see some answers there. I see, oh, quite a few C's. Oh, okay. All right, anybody else? Last chance. Yes, the correct answer is indeed C. Uh, the TOEFL IBT test is accepted and preferred worldwide. Uh, it is actually accepted by over 12,500 institutions, meaning universities, grad schools, uh, for visa purposes as well, for professional purposes, for working as well in many countries, over 160 countries around the world. And one of the common misconceptions people have with the TOEFL is that it's a test that you only need if you're going to study in the United States. And while that's true, it is, it is accepted at 100% of universities in the United States, and it is the preferred test for 90% of the universities there. However, it is also accepted at 100% of universities in the UK, in the United Kingdom, 100% of universities in Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, 
uh, and it is actually the preferred test in many, many countries around the world. So uh, it is a test of academic English, and it is a test that really helps to prepare you for the kind of activities and the kind of skills that you will need to use in a real life English academic setting. Okay, so if you're planning to study at a university in English, the types of tasks that the TOEFL asks of you actually help to measure your English very accurately. And it consists of four sections. The reading section first, which consists of two texts, followed by 10 questions each. Then we have the listening section, which consists of three lectures or talks given by a professor and two conversations. Then we have four speaking tasks, um, which actually are not just speaking, they actually use what we call integrated skills, meaning that it's, again, this is a, a test which is very practical in the sense that you will be asked to do things that you would probably have to do at the university. So for example, you would have to listen to a lecture by a teacher talking on a topic. Then maybe you would have to read something on the same topic. And then you would have to produce speaking or writing based on the input that you receive. So both the speaking and the writing sections are not just speaking, not just writing, but they also combine the skills in a very realistic way to be able to show that you can understand the information, process it, and synthesize it, being, being able to compare and contrast and all these things that you'll have to do in your classes at the university. Uh, one of the, the things I should point out too is that the, the test, of course, has changed over the years. It has evolved quite a bit. And now the test is just under two hours. So uh, this is a test which basically you can take once and it's a multi-level test. So it covers from B1 to C2. And depending on your score, it will it, certain universities will actually require certain minimum scores. So speaking of scores, I'll just go, uh, oh, sorry, before we go to the scores, uh, there are two ways to, to take the test. The first way is what we call the test center or the classic way of taking a test, meaning that you would go to a test center and uh, they have usually several different dates per, per month, sometimes several dates per week, depending on the season and the location. In Spain, for example, we have approximately 40 test centers in Spain and uh, three in Portugal. Uh, in Italy, Marta, how many do you have test centers right now? About 35. 35, yeah, in Italy. So it is quite easy to find a test center. There are sessions every month, various sessions, uh, depending on the city where you live. But we also have the home edition as well. So for the home edition, we have uh, the opportunity to actually do the same exact test from the comfort of your own home and uh, using live proctoring. So there is a monitor who will actually be present during the entire test, looking at you through the camera and using artificial intelligence, eye tracking, make sure you're not cheating. <laughs> uh, and, but it is exactly the same test that you would do in the test center. Of course, you always have to check with the university to make sure that they accept both the test center and the home edition, but many universities will accept either one. And uh, finally, going back to the scores here, as I mentioned, it is a multi-level test. So it covers from B1 to C2, meaning that you take the test one time and depending on your score, it will give you a language level, both in total and based on individual skills. So we have uh, reading, listening, speaking, writing, each section is equally weighted 30 points per section for a total of 120 points. So for example, if you get anywhere between a 72 to a 94, that would be in the B2 range, which is the range that most universities tend to ask for as a minimum. 
starting at 95, that would be the C1 range. 95 to 113 would be C1. And to give you an example, Harvard, uh, Harvard requires, Harvard University requires a score of 95, sorry, 105, 105, which would be a strong C1. So in the middle, C1 to C2. So each university can actually require their own minimum score depending on, on the university, but also sometimes depending on the program or the department as well. And they might also require a minimum score in a specific skill as well. So for example, they might want to see if you can really speak English. So they might require a certain minimum in the speaking section as well. Marcus? Okay, thank you, Marcus. Yes. So now that uh, Marcus has told you everything that you need to know about the structure of the test, what the test looks like, the different section, the score requirements, where to take the test, uh, your next questions might be, okay, but how do I register? And uh, first and foremost, how do I prepare for the test? So the registration process is very easy and straightforward. You see these uh, four steps here. You first create your TOEFL account. Creating your TOEFL account is completely free. So you can do it, of course, ahead of time, and it will be also useful for your preparation. You will see in a second. Then you decide whether to take the test at home for the home edition or in a test center. And in this case, you pick, of course, the test center, the location. For both the home edition and the test center uh, test, you pick a date and time. And finally, you complete the registration and you proceed with the payment. And once again, I would like to remind you that we have good news for you because uh, we will, before uh, finishing the webinar, we will be um, sharing a discount code for uh, you valid in uh, Spain, Portugal, and Italy, our three countries. Uh, so what is next is our uh, preparation. This is what your uh, profile, TOEFL profile will look like. So you can see it here. You can register for the test. Uh, there's a button, but if you navigate on the uh, bottom left-hand uh, corner of the page, you see a, a section dedicated to test preparation. And just by clicking on it, you can access our um, preparation hub that is called TOEFL Test Ready. So what will you find in TOEFL Test Ready? Everything you need to prepare for the TOEFL IBT. You will find both uh, free material and paid resources. Uh, what we would like to um, share with you is always the free resources, because what I always say, I don't know um, if you, Marcus, agree, is go for the free resources first, first and then uh, if you need something else to purchase something else, you can uh, always do it in, in a second mode. So there are three main free resources in TOEFL Test Ready. The first one is the, our first point here, the rotating activity of the day. So every day in the TOEFL Test Ready uh, portal, you will find a free activity that can be uh, listening, reading, speaking, writing, whatever. And it's uh, mostly it's uh, AI scored. So um, even for the um, writing task or the um, speaking task, AI will actually score your answer and give you some feedback and tell you, OK, you got this answer. You got four point out of five. You need to improve this or that uh, skill, this or that uh, point. Uh, you also have uh, the practice test. Um, which we recommend you should absolutely take uh, when starting maybe your prep journey and uh, right before the uh, actual TOEFL IBT test, because it's exactly the same as the real thing, as the TOEFL test. And it is, again, scored by AI. So you will get a very clear idea of your final score. And once again, you will get some tips on how to improve things that maybe you should, should still develop a bit more. Uh, and also, you have the personalized study plan that you see here uh, on the bottom. It means that uh, just by entering some information about how long you have to prepare, what is your uh, target score, you will get a personalized, very detailed study plan with all of the checklists. So let's say you want to put a boost on writing because you feel a little weak uh, on writing and you have, I don't know, four weeks to prepare and you aim at taking a 95 the personalized study plan will give you a step-by-step -step checklist to follow for your preparation. So this is very, very useful. And again, it's all um, available for free in TOEFL Test Ready together with other um, uh, paid material. 
this is an example just for you to see of uh, how AI scores um, the so-called uh, productive skills, so speaking and writing. This is a, a writing task, the academic uh, writing for an academic discussion task. You will see that this answer was scored four out of five points, and then you could click on the I and see what it means. Uh, and it scores uh, these uh, language skills or categories. So grammar, usage, mechanics, organization development. And the problem with this uh, answer was in the organization development part. So you know that to imp in order to improve, you will need to work on, for example, supporting your uh, ideas uh, or um, stating a main, a main idea or the transitional words uh, and, and phrases. So moreover, um, additionally, et cetera, et cetera. So you know exactly what it is that you're still missing and what you need to work on to get the best possible score. So uh, we just gave you a quick uh, glimpse, a quick idea of what the TOEFL IBT is, how to prepare, how to register uh, and everything. You can scan here if you want uh, some more information, then we will uh, afterwards leave uh, our contact so that you can keep in touch. And you can also uh, follow us on our mm, social media. We're everywhere um, if you want to know all the latest news about our tests, plural, not only TOEFL, but in this case, TOEFL specifically. Uh, and now let me stop sharing my screen. OK, there we go. Um, and um, let me uh, hand it back to Candy for some more valuable insights on how to write an admission essay. Candy, the floor is yours. Okay, perfect. And share. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing that information. It's so interesting because I used to teach TOEFL years ago and to see how it's changed and streamlined and sort of just really adapted to, you know, the current the current world we live in. So that's very exciting. Thank you for talking about that. Um, wonderful. So let's... I'd love to just do a quick review about what I was talking about um, before when we started the session, which is sort of like what I call the basics, right? You wanna get into a, a, a top university abroad, you have to have these basics. So we talked about a diploma or a degree, you need good grades. So go ahead and get that great, those good grades, the strong GPA. Letters of recommendation are so, so powerful. So build those relationships. Make sure you know which tests you have to take at which university and for which program. Get your TOEFL IBT score. And as, as Marcus was explaining, each school might have, or each school or each program might have a different uh, score that you need. So make sure you know what you need and you get it in time. Um, more basics of applying, you know, a lot of the, what we call the, again, the post experience uh, programs like MBA, you have to have a resume. You have to fill out an application where you put a lot of data, you know, data points about yourself. It's actually called a data form is the name of the application. Um, so these are the basics. If you want an Asia University application, you need this. Like this is the foundational, but basics are not enough. Basics are not enough. The programs, you know, that we're looking at abroad that you might want to study in are competitive. They're attractive. People around the world would love to go to these university programs. Um, so they're gonna have good grades and great diplomas and wonderful test scores and wonderful letters of recommendation. So you gotta have that base, but you gotta go a little bit further as well. And the way you do that, the way you sort of really stand out um, would be the essays, okay? So pretty much every university, you know, whether it's Harvard or HEC in Paris or the University of Tennessee, require essays. Sometimes it's one essay, you know, a one essay of a thousand words. It can be up to 10 essays. Maybe you need to write a, a total of 500 words or a total of 5,000 words. Again, it depends on the program. It depends on the university, but you're going to have to write essays. That is absolutely fundamental. Um, and doing them well really is the secret of acing your application. So there's lots of different types of essays. So personal statement is a, is a fairly generic, uh, broad term. It's sometimes called a statement of purpose. So this is usually um, an essay that asks you, uh, wh why are you applying here? What do you want? Why are you going to this program? Uh, uh, why do you think you're going to excel? That sort of thing. So it's a fairly broad and generic essay. Other essays are more focused, such as what are your goals? 
tell us about your goals. What do you want to do following this degree? What do you want to do with your life? Some essays, um, you know, specifically ask more about you as a person. Tell us about yourself. Who are you? What makes you tick? Uh, there's usually going to be some sort of question around why do you want this degree? Why do you want to go to this university? Those are almost always a given. Uh, and so much more. There are so many more different types of um, essays out there. Here are a couple, well, a few, I've got six here, that are in um, circulation right now, that people are writing these essays right now for different programs around the world. Uh, share something meaningful to you. So here, the school would like you to share something that you care about, why you care about it, how it enriches your life, et cetera. Um, another common essay is a time you faced an obstacle or a challenge. And of course, what did you do and what did you learn? Uh, tell us about someone you admire is also a, a common essay. What matters most to you and why? We call this the Stanford, uh, this is the Stanford MBA big essay. They've been asking this big giant what matters most to you essay for years. It's quite a, it's intense and fun. A time you promoted inclu uh, inclusivity or you promoted diversity um, or, or any sort of form of tell us who you are, right? Uh, there's a wonderful essay from Duke University that says, list 25 random facts about yourself, which is a really, really fun essay. So essays come in all sorts of different shapes, all sorts of different um, requirements. Before you write them, though, I want you to understand, this is very important, there are some rules you have to follow. Every year I meet applicants who applied, they gave their heart and soul, and they're like, I didn't get accepted, what happened? And when I go to check what they did, I found out that they broke some basic rules. So one of the basic rules is answer the question. Okay, that seems obvious, but many people get so overwhelmed. Like I'm applying to MIT, oh, I'm applying to Cambridge. They get really nervous and they end up going off, going off, uh, off track. So maybe the question says, what are your goals? You know, 300 words, what are your goals? And they spent 200 words talking about their grandfather's childhood in Peru and uh, the civil war in, in Ethiopia or just something that matters to them and makes sense in their head, but it's not answering the question. So answer the question that is being asked. Two, follow the guidelines. So every essay has a guideline, 500 words, 50 characters, um, double spacing, um, some sort of like formatting that you have to follow. If you don't follow those guidelines, pretty much all this amazing work that you did to apply is going to be jeopardized because you didn't follow the rules. So please, please, if they say essay limit is 500 words, okay, you can write 504, but you can't write 520. You need to follow the rules. Um, number three, use clear, use a structure. So in English writing, um, as, you, as you probably have learned already, there's always going to be a beginning you know, introduction, the middle, which is sort of the body of your essay, and then an ending. You want to have that sort of clear structure. You want to use clear and normal language. So applying to a university is not an exercise in poetry or literature. Well, I mean, if you're applying for a master's in poetry, yes, then you have to be poetic. But for the most part, you need to use clear normal language. Answer the questions in the type of words that you use every day. You don't have to use fancy, crazy words that you don't normally use. Um, of course, the words you do use need to be correct. You need to have correct grammar, correct spelling and punctuation, which means you need to get your essays edited and proofread. Now, you can hire an admissions consultant, but you can also ask your mom, a friend, a colleague. Um, you know, a lot of different people can sort of help. You just don't want to write and send it on your own. Definitely have someone take a second look. So these are the rules, All right. The next thing you need to know, even before we start writing, is you need to know who is reading your essay. So again, a lot of people get very nervous if they're applying to, Har um, to Oxford or they're applying to Berkeley or UCLA. They get super nervous about it. Oh, I gotta, oh, I don't, you know, I gotta, do, you know, I gotta be so impressive and stuff. And they forget they're talking to a person. The, the, there is a person reading your essay. It is a, a person who maybe that morning got up and stubbed their toe or got stuff stuck in traffic or whatever, they just got engaged. But they're a person, you need to remember that they are there reading a lot of essays in one day. Some schools have 30, some up to 100 in a day. And I'm actually not kidding there. So it's intense, it's an intense job for them. They're reading and reading. 
maybe they're going to spend five minutes on your essay. Maybe they're going to spend 15. Um, Harvard Business School, I know for a fact, will spend two hours. Thank you, Harvard Business School, for taking that uh, effort. But for the most part, they're they're whipping through it. So they need to understand your answer, right? Remember when I said you need to answer the question and follow the rules? This is where it matters, okay? So they're stressed. They're going through this. So they're under pressure. And your job as the essay writer is to make their job easier by writing essays that they're going to like, writing essays that make them like want to know you more, that they're reading and maybe they smile. Maybe they're thinking, oh, this is... Hmm, this is not just another engineering student. That, yeah, ooh. And suddenly they like you, right? Now that sounds like nice, simple advice in this beautiful bullet point. I know it's not that, that easy. So let's go look into a little bit more about how we do that. I talk to a lot of admissions people all the time. Um, once you start your university process, you're going to be reading blogs and essays, and you're going to hear these two words nonstop. Be authentic. Be authentic. What are you looking for in admission in an essay? We want to see applicants who are authentic. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be authentic? Well, it means a lot of different things. It means to be honest, to be you. Don't make up some stuff. If you graduated, you know, number three in your university, you don't have to talk about your graduating number one. Don't, you know, just be honest. Uh, if you graduate number 50, it doesn't matter. Be honest and be you. Tell your story in your own voice, in the words that you would use. Now, I have to add here, please don't use chat GPT. Chat GPT is not at a level yet where it emulates a real authentic voice. Um, and think about it. Imagine you're at a party and you meet this amazing person. They're like, oh, tell me about yourself. Are you going to run to the bathroom and pop into chat GTP to get your story out perfect? It's like, no, you're going to start telling your story from your voice. That's the voice you need for your essays. When you're writing the essays, another way to be authentic is to share the why behind your choices. Now, it's easy to say, you know, I I chose to study um, biology. You know, I have a degree in microbiology. I have a degree in environmental sciences, or I started my career here, or I decided to move there. That's fine. Those are facts, but we need the why. Why did you study these things? What excited you about biology? Why did you move to Germany? Why did you do these different things? Because that's what start mixing, makes you more authentic, right? It makes you more real. Don't be afraid to share what you care most about. Remember a few slides ago, I told you about that wonderful Stanford essay that says, what matters most and why? Um, admissions director a couple years ago acknowledged that the majority of people who write that essay talk about family, friends, and faith, because that's the things that matter most to them. Of course, they build the whole essay around the rest of it, but it's what they care about. That's where they start their essays. Don't be afraid to share what you enjoy, whatever it might be, and to show your unique self. So these are all things to do. Again, it's easier for me to say this to you than for you to do it because it is going to take time. You cannot start your university application essays a week ahead of time, right? Or even a month. You really need to start this whole process six months ahead of time, even more to really sort of self-reflect and figure out who are you? What do you care about? Now, I always uh, suggest to my applicants that I work with that before we even get to the essays, before we even talk about those, Let's think about who you are. So these are just, I give my, my clients a list of like 100 questions, but here are some of the more common. What do you care most about? What are you most proud of in your life? Uh, what is your superpower? This is one of my favorite. I've had several applicants who are just, I don't know what to say. I don't know who I am. And then I say, what's your superpower? And they're like, bing, it appears. I remember one wonderful girl who told me that it, her eyes lit up and she's like, oh, she's like, I make things happen. Whatever it is, I can get it done. And from there, she knew what to do. She was able to build a whole story from there. What makes you unique? What makes you special? What do you dream of? These are all things that are going to help you to find your authentic story. Okay. Uh, I want to give you a couple of quick examples just so you can kind of see what this looks like in an essay. Now, you could begin an essay saying, I graduated at the top of my class in my country's best engineering program. That's fine. That's, that's okay. Or you could say, I always love taking things apart to see how they work. So going to engineering school was a dream for me. Now, I had a client a few years ago who started one of his essays saying, 
when I was six years old, I took apart my, my toy car and put the motor in my Playmobil and created a, a motorized Playmobil, right? Guess where he went to university? MIT. Because that essay resonated, it told them who he was and the way he thought from the time he was a little kid until now. So you don't be afraid to share these sort of like stories. My goal is to work in consulting at a top firm and to specialize in energy. Fantastic, that's a great goal. Why? I'm happiest tackling tough problems and in consulting, I wanna tackle climate change and working in energy projects is a great way to start. So the second example, first of all, says a little bit about who's writing it. They're happy. They like to be challenged. They like tough things. Well, guess what you do in university? A lot of tough problems. Um, they care about climate change. They want to try and make things work. They understand that if I learn about energy, I can probably, you know, go to the next level. So it's a, it's they're saying the same thing, but one is giving so much more information to admissions. I deeply admire Steve Jobs um, or Warren Buffett or Nelson Mandela. I mean, these are all wonderful, wonderful people. They're wonderful people to admire, but it's a little generic, really. I mean, a lot of people could say they admire Steve Jobs, but not a lot of people could say, my grandmother broke gender barriers to become our town's first female mayor, or my single mom did this, or my, you know, my grandfather is my idol or whatever it might be. If you get more personal, you're sharing more of who you are. You're being more authentic. And even the story, the sentence itself is telling us the person who wrote this essay is coming from a place where people fight for their goals. They're, they're not limited. They don't accept the status quo. And by, you know, we can also, if I'm the reader of the essay, I can assume, oh, this applicant must also be like that. So those are samples of how to become authentic. Now, one thing I want to leave you with. Now, this is Dr. Seuss. Well, this is the cat in the hat. He's from Dr. Seuss. So if you don't know Dr. Seuss, uh, he's full of so much wisdom. And one of my absolute favorite things to tell any applicant writer, essay writer, is that today you are you, and that's truer than true. There's no one alive who is youer than you. Being you, being authentic, sharing what you care about, what makes you tick, that is the absolute secret to acing your university application, um, and and you got it. You're already you, so you know how to go for it. Now, we are going to move on, and we are going to meet someone who's actually already done that. She's already aced her application, so I'm going to go ahead and sign out, and we will have Georgia come on. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much, Candy. That that was uh, very insightful. And yes, as Candy said, uh, we have uh, a testimonial, somebody who has already aced her application, Giorgia Italia. Uh, she's an Italian student who, much like you, was preparing to embark on uh, this journey as an international student in the U.S. just last year. And now she has uh, successfully completed her first year of college. I won't say more because I will let Georgia uh, tell you all about it. Hi, Georgia. How are you doing? Hey, I'm good. Thank you. So, um, tell us a bit about yourself. So, why did you, uh, what motivated you to go study in the U.S.? Uh, what, can you tell us what you do there, if you like it so far? Tell us a bit about it. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mainly chose to go study in the U.S. during my fourth year of high school here in Milan. Um, we have five years total here in Italy which is very different from what they do in the U.S. And I just decided to go abroad for six months at first. And I absolutely loved it there. The school system, all the different courses, I just preferred the way um, of like education that they have. So it's not just school, but it's much more than that. And then when I had to come back, I went back to school in Italy for about two weeks and I did not like it. <laughs> so I talked with my parents and I just told them like, I want to go back. And at this point, it was November, so I was pretty late with my applications because they were due um, the first days of the new year. So I was a little bit stressed, but I was able to do everything in one month and I applied to about like 12 schools. So a lot of essays, <laughs> but um, yeah, I got accepted. Yeah. Right. That that would be my, my second question to you. So what was your experience? You anticipated something with the application process for studying in the U.S.? And so the challenges you, you faced and the ones you uh, overcame, apparently, and uh, did something that Candice uh, said resonate with you? 
Yeah, for sure. So at first, again, application process, very stressful. Um, I felt very overwhelmed, especially having such a short amount of time to get everything done. But definitely uh, for the U.S. at least, uh, they have like the Common App. And basically you have a bunch of schools all in the same kind of application portal. So you can kind of share some of the information to all of them and you don't have to do everybody, everything like singularly, which was very helpful. And again, a thing that I would like advice is while you're writing your essays, most like most questions are different for the different schools. They wanna know different things, but some of them are pretty much the same. So if you can use one essay, for multiple applications and just change it a little bit around. Definitely like that's a smart thing to do. You don't have to write like 20 different essays because it's crazy. Um, but yeah, and then again, applications letters for sure. Ask someone that like actually knows you because they want to know personal things about you, like how you act in like the real world and not only how your grades are. Of course, grades are also important, but they want to know if you could fit in the environment of the school and the community that you're going to join. Uh, that was like a big thing for me uh, that I also wrote on my essays. I also had a few interviews for like scholarships and I saw that a point that they were really interested in was like community and being a member. They want you to go to university and be a great student, but also be part of like their everyday life, clubs, association, everything that they have to offer, sports. It's much more than just school, even though, of course, the academic part is very important. So definitely essays was a big part. Get I had like my parents read them over. Um, that was very helpful. And, and yeah, application letters, people that know you, they can like talk well about you um, for sure. And then they wanna see your extracurriculars, volunteering. Um, I think volunteering is also something that makes you kind of stand out because you do things that you like, such as sports, clubs, but also something that is like not for yourself, but for the community. And again, big on community. So that would be um, the application part that was very important for me, definitely. Um, and I you also... haven't told us yet, Georgia, sorry to interrupt. You haven't told us yet what you study and where. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my bad. Um, so I'm a student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I just finished my first year and I'm studying. My major is animal science and I have a minor in art history. So wow. my to become a vet. So I'm going to try to get on the pre-vet track next semester. And I'm loving it there so far, really. Um I love the school. I love the area. Um, also a big part was like the area for me choosing like where to go. Uh, so I'm in Massachusetts, kind of near Boston, like two hours from Boston. Yeah. Um, and no, I definitely love it. I love the U.S. and I'm so happy that I'm there. Um, and also part of the application process that I was just thinking about, definitely the language proficiency, especially as an international student. There you they go. Know that you're able to understand the courses and that you can live Exactly, um, country because otherwise it won't work. Um, and that, that would have been my last question for you. So, how did the TOEFL test contribute to your this journey of yours towards uh, studying internationally? Yeah. So, um, another thing that I would say is very big when you're looking into the schools that you know you want to apply to. They kind of all have this different like proficiencies uh, that like exams specifics that they wanna uh, they want you to give them. So definitely see where you wanna go and then look at all the exams that you have to take because for me it was multiple ones um and the TOEFL I did it online last year yeah so I had it like proctored I did the practice everything that you were talking about earlier um and then I got the grade that I needed uh, for certain schools um not for others but you know again you have a big variety of all the, the proficiencies that they need. Uh, but yeah, definitely it helped me. And also in the schools that didn't like require the TOEFL, um, I still sent it in because I was like, I mean, I might as well. It looks good. Like they yeah. can see that I have multiple like proficiency exams and well-rounded. So even if you have to do multiple ones and that could be a little bit overwhelming, still like take advantage of that and send everything in. I feel like the more, the better. Um, but yeah, cause you definitely have to like sponsor yourself without then, you know, becoming cocky and everything. I remember a big part for me was, I don't really like just like talking about myself. Um, but you have to do it a little bit in your essays cause they want to know about you. So okay. definitely. You have to open up a bit. Well, thank you so much, Georgia. Best of luck for the future as a, as a vet. Thank uh, you. And, uh, uh, I see we already have some, uh, questions. So. First of all, again, 
Thank you. Gracias. Grazie. And uh, I see that we have. Obrigado. Obrigado. Oh, sorry. I forgot the Portuguese. My Portuguese friends. Um, so. Okay. okay. I guess, yeah. So... We can open the floor. Thank you so much, George. It was really great hearing from you. Thank you. And your experience. Um, so we can open the floor to questions. Yes, so thank you to all of you. It was really interesting. And so we got different questions. So let's start. Uh, the first one is, um, I really need to understand the difference between IELTS and TOEFL, which is better if I want to study abroad. If we had a Europe uh, every time they ask this question, right, Mark? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we're not going to get into which is better, but, um, but we, we will say that uh, they, are, they are similar in many aspects, um, but basically what it comes down to is where you're applying and what they're requiring. In general, the, the TOEFL is, is accepted everywhere the IELTS is and more. It's actually the most accepted tests of academic English for admissions purposes in the world. Um, and it is more accepted within North America than the IELTS. Everywhere else, they're accepted uh, equally, more or less. They're both accepted 100% of universities in the UK, 100% of universities in Ireland, Australia. So it really just kind of depends on, on what you're looking for. Uh, the TOEFL is sh a shorter test. It's uh, it's just under two hours now. Um, so, so that might be uh, an advantage for you. Yeah, and one more difference, uh, and again, it depends on you yourself, what you prefer, is that the speaking part for the TOEFL is within the same session so you won't have to go back or in the afternoon or take the test the speaking part another day and it's um uh, by a computer so you won't be interacting with uh, an examiner uh, that will be asking questions it will be all um within the same session with your own computer or the test center's computer if you choose to take it at a test center perfect thank you for clarifying this so um, let's move to the next one. Um, they are asking uh, if the platform for TOEFL is free. Yes, TOEFL Test Ready is absolutely 100% free. It's uh, You just have to register, like to create your own TOEFL account. Once you've created it, you can access the, the platform. There are some paid materials, but you will see where they are. The rest of it is 100% free. And, and there are other free materials on there as well. There's an there's an eight week planning guide. So yeah. for example, if you know that you're going to take the test in two months, right? There's actually a, a free PDF that you can download, which lays out a whole uh, plan for you. If you want something, you know, on paper or, or something more physical that you can take with you. Um, there also is a free online course hosted by edX. It's a full online yeah. course called the Insider's Guide to the TOEFL. So there's a lot of free resources out there. There's also TOEFL TV. Uh, a YouTube channel which uh, goes inside the test and it, and it shows you examples of questions, tips how to answer them. So that there's a lot of free resources out there to practice on your own. And of course, lots of uh, language schools that prepare prep courses, uh, crash courses one month. Perfect. Thank you. This was really helpful, I guess, for our students. And also kind of related to this, we got another question. That is, uh, do you have any advice about how to study for the TOEFL? Any techniques? I'm dyslexic and I found it really difficult to learn English. Okay. So first of all, you should know that you can ask for um, uh, uh, the uh, some uh, help in case you have some um, uh, problems like this, this, uh, sorry, dyslexia, for example. Uh, so you can ask, depending on um, what you usually get in uh, at school, for example, you can ask for additional time, you can ask for uh, extra breaks. Breaks are not, um, uh, there are no breaks in TOEFL normally, but you can ask for a break if needed. You can ask for a spell checker. So there are a lot of, um, uh, let's say, things that can help you um, in case of dyslexia or other uh, learning disabilities. Um, the only important thing for you to know is you should make all of these requirements before registering for the test. So again, you, we go back to the TOEFL uh, profile, TOEFL account. Uh, you will see a section uh, next to actually the one about preparation that is um, TOEFL with accommodation. And there you can require all of the accommodation you need, of course, uploading the, the documents. Uh, and you can uh, then send out the, the request. And once it is approved, you can register for the test. For the test, so this is the only step to um, to remember. Perfect. Thank you so much. 
So um, let's go with another question related to TOEFL. Uh, Sarah is asking, um, is the TOEFL also useful if I want to work abroad? Yes. Mark, do you want to take this? Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, again, it always depends on specific country requirements, specific uh, job requirements. Um, uh, but for many countries, the TOEFL is accepted for visa purposes. For example, in Australia, um, it is uh, accepted for visa purposes in, in Canada. So again, you you have to kind of just look for where you want to work and what purposes exactly. Um, with student visas in the US, for example, as well, student visas allow you usually to work, depending on the type of visa, sometimes up to 20 hours a week uh, as a part-time uh, job as well. Um, and then also for post uh, studies, graduate programs and postgraduate, and for uh, professional studies and professional work as well, many times it is accepted. And within countries, for example, um, here in Spain, we have these, you know, the oposiciones, these state exams. It is accepted as well there for many of these state exams to certify your English level. Same thing in Italy. The TOEFL is recognized by uh, MIM, Ministero di uh, Istruzione del Merito. So uh, it is an officially recognized task can, that can also be used for work purposes, for example, in Italy, but in many other countries. Perfect. Thank you so much. And another question is, um, which is a good score to get accepted at a university in the UK? Really specific. Maybe yeah, you can give us some insights. Maybe Candy will, will know the answer more than we do, because I think it, it depends a lot on... It uh, yeah. definitely does depend. And I know I'm much more familiar with the graduate world than the undergraduate. Um, I know that Cambridge and Oxford have a 110 for many of their graduate programs. So, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think in general, <laughs> most undergrad schools in the US, for example, usually require somewhere in the... 75 to 90 range um mm -hmm. but uh harvard for example requires a 105 um so kind Your of the most is required mm -hmm. strong b2 range okay thank you so now talking a bit about mba atfed is asking us uh, can we have more information about mba application as well is that the question is more information about mba application uh, yeah, I guess like suggestions um, uh, for essays related to the MBA. So you do, if you're going to apply to an MBA, like I said, the first thing you need to know is you need to know what you're up against. So you need to know what's required from the test to the letters of recommendation to your work experience to your resume. Um, MBA applications run in rounds. So right now we're in the end of May and we're already it's it's on. We are in the the throes of applications which are due in September. Um, so you kind of also have to know when the deadlines are and, and get started in that process. Um, yeah, there's tons of information out there. Um, it, it, a lot of it's good. <laughs> a lot of it's very confusing. But I would say just try to figure out the main steps, which is to figure out what schools you want to go to, do your research. If you go to any school for MBA, like if you would go to London Business School or Columbia, you attend one of their events and they tell you what you want to know. So for example, if you're in Madrid, both Columbia Business School and Wharton are coming to Madrid in, in a month. So attend those events and you'll know what to do. Perfect. Thank you so much, Candy. Um, let's go ahead with another question related to essays. Aurora is asking, is there something that you don't like or don't suggest to put in our essays? Absolutely. Do not put negativity. Now, there's two reasons for that. One, again, remember, a person who is potentially stressed out and under pressure is reading your essay. They don't need to read your excuse and your negativity about how bad and unfair life was and how awful your professor was. Always find a positive spin, okay? Um, I did have a client recently who had had several job changes, which can be challenging when you're applying for an MBA, for example. And at first she wanted to explain it. Well, this happened and that happened. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's step back. What did you get out of it? Job one, what was the positive thing? She's like, oh, well, I learned this and this. Let's focus on that. Then when I got to this job, I learned that and that and that. So she focused on the positive and she acknowledged quite honestly, I understand I have an unusual career trajectory for you and I'd love to explain the reasoning. Stay positive and be honest. These are like really, really core things. Avoid the negativity, no negativity. 
I really like this advice. Uh, thank you so much, Candy. Works on so, first date. <laughs> um, another, this is a question that maybe um, also Georgia can help us. They are asking, do you suggest to apply to different university in the US? I guess that this question uh, came in the right moment in which Georgia was talking. I guess she did say that she applied to uh, several universities, so that could be a good idea to have more than just one chance. Yeah, um, I applied to 12 again, which is a lot. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I applied to like a big variety. What I've heard, at least what my counselor told me at the time, is that there are like three different levels. So like the, the, the higher ones, so like the Ivy Leagues, the ones that are like really hard to get into. And then that there, there are the ones like you can get into like your levels. And then, you know, depending on like also what you want to do, it's very specific. Every university really, the level depends on what you want to do there because they have like different majors. So I would definitely say apply to different ones because you never know if you're like going to get in or not. And it's better to just have like a backup also because some schools maybe won't like get you just because like accept you because they know that like you're not going to go here and you apply just like for safety. So, you know, the more you apply, the more variety you have. And also you can choose and it's always better to choose than just like have one choice that is like pushed into you. So I would definitely recommend that. And actually, Georgia, you mentioned you use the, the Common app, right? The Common app yeah. is, is an app. I don't know if, if, if they know this, but um it's an app that basically allows you to apply to many universities at once uh, and you can yeah, kind of save some of the work and sometimes some of the fees because uh, it is expensive sometimes if you're going to apply it, to a lot of universities. Yeah. However, many universities will actually waive the fees if you um, if you ask for some financial assistance or so mm -hmm. it is important to to look into that as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you a lot also, Georgia. Um, Another question, Amali is asking uh, if the certificates, uh, also if you know IELTS and TOEFL, if they has an expiry date. Okay, that is a, another very common question. Yes and no. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, it means that the 99% uh, of universities, institutions, governments, whoever accepts uh, TOEFL or other uh, certifications uh, scores, will only accept scores that are not older than two years. So in that sense, yes. So you should um, uh, consider that your score is valid in terms of official applications for two years. So you cannot apply to Harvard or Cambridge or London School of Economics or wherever if you have a, um, a score that is older than two years. Why? Because the language proficiency changes. So after two years, if you took your test five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe you're not uh, that proficient anymore, or maybe you're more proficient than that. So uh, how can they know? So the result is guaranteed within this two year um, time span. Now this said, uh, if you wanna put uh, your TOEFL score in your CV to get give your uh, possible employers an idea of your average uh, English proficiency level, then this is perfectly possible and there is no uh, expiration date for that. Good to know. Thank you so much, Marta. And then we have another final question. They are asking if you order if you offer other tests. We do. We do. We offer, uh, for example, TOEIC, Test of English for International Communication. Um, TOEIC, um, while uh, TOEFL, as Marcus said at the beginning, is uh, uh, an academic text test, so specifically thought for um, university students, for example, but also again for um, visa or work requirements. Uh, TOEIC is more based on the everyday life or uh, work life. So the situation uh, you will find are um, uh, are different. The, the listening task or the writing task are not um, like, uh, do not take place in an academic environment. Unlike TOEFL, they take place in an everyday life environment. Uh, we also offer GRE, for example, that is not an English uh, proficiency test. It is a test in English, but uh, it is used for um, to assess um, uh, quantitative reasoning, verbal reasoning. So uh, it's uh, often a requirement by, for example, um, for um, application to MBAs 
or um, engineering school, something that is more technical. Mm -hmm. Am I forgetting something, Marcus? Yeah, and also just to point out, so, so yeah, the GRE test, which Candy mentioned, actually is a really big requirement for master's programs around the world as well. So it, it's a general knowledge test, uh, basically. Um, and then also the SAT, which Candy mentioned, which yeah. is uh, a, a test that most universities require or recommend for their applications, is actually um, the ETS works very closely with the College Board in the U.S. for the design and administration of the SAT as well. So uh, Educational Testing Service is actually the, the largest private research and assessment institution in the world. Thank you. Uh, this was really interesting. So thanks a lot to who made this question. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I guess that we're done with the questions. And we would like to leave you with uh, what we promised before. So this is the uh, discount you get. Once again, valid for Italy, Spain, and Portugal, the countries where uh, most of you are from. Uh, and it's a 50% uh, discount code for the TOEFL IBT. Uh, so it's valid until the end of September. So when registering, just um, insert this uh, uh, total CT3 discount code and you will get 50% off. Thank you so much, Marta. Okay, so thanks again to our panelists uh, to be with us today and thanks to everyone to have joined our webinar. So I've been like... I'm really impressive because you were really curious and responsive. So I'm really happy to be our panelist today. So I hope that um, we have reached our goal and that you learn a lot from this webinar made in collaboration with ETS Global. I'd like to remind you that you can contact our panelists at the email that uh, you saw in the slide. So maybe Marta, if you can go. Sure. Okay. In this way, also our student can take note uh, of your email and also you can discover more about their test in, um, in the website that you can see here. So if you're interested in receive our certificate of attendance, you can also click um, in the link that I've sent now in the chat. And keep also in mind that we will share the recording with you in the following days. So keep an eye on your email. At this point, I wanted to ask our panelists if you want to leave a message before saying goodbye to our students. Good luck. <laughs> I would say do not give up. The process of applying to a university abroad is long, but you are on the right path. So don't give up. You got it. And don't use chat GPT for your essays. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Congrats you. It was a pleasure. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias.